Big Fluff. Hello, world. It's Stephanie Smart, and I am here to tell you. Uh. that I know some shit. Exotica. Hello, everyone. I'm Joel Murphy. And I'm Stephanie Smarr. And this is Stephanie Knows Some Shit. So what are we going to be talking about this week? So I thought long and hard about it, and I was like, what are the weird questions that I get a lot? And one of them that I'm very like dedicated to is things I wish I knew before making that reservation. So we're going to go over when do you eat? When's the fish freshest? What are the red flags that you really need to run from? Um, What do you feel comfortable asking your server and what should you not say to them and vice versa? Because a lot of things get said at the table. So I thought that would be a really fun way to start today is just like, you find that perfect restaurant, you see it on open table, you're like, this looks like a good idea, but I'm only free on Sundays and it is a strictly fish restaurant. You know, there's a lot of questions that come with that because nobody delivers fish on Sundays. So I thought that's what we dive into. When do they deliver fish? Um, Fridays and sometimes Saturdays. Not to say anything weird happens to the fish over two days, but like, I don't know. (laughs) It's not fresh. Yeah, there's some funk associated with it. So, so if you want fish, you're saying Friday or Saturday? That's the day. I'm saying Monday or Tuesday are actually your best bet because you've been the restaurant has been work through through the weekend. They are done with everything. They need to get everything in fresh on Mondays and Tuesdays. And I'm saying Tuesday is a comfortable one because they're still re-upping their pars. So you're still getting like the best of the best. And I know this because I worked at a place that only served seafood for years. Was that your, that was your first job, right? Or was it a seafood restaurant? That was my first job working for Barbara Lynch. So I worked at B&G Oysters. Right. Um, Yeah. Obviously oysters, Mm -hmm. lobster, like you name it. Um, But we would get crushed on the weekend and have no fish to start out Mondays with. So that was like the day where you ordered the most. And was it pretty, is it pretty consistent? Like, uh, is it the the same stuff over and over again? Or is there a fluctuation in the menu at those kind of places? I would 100% say that it's universal. Like everybody goes through this every single week. Sundays are probably the hardest days to eat in a restaurant. And they're also like, unfortunately, my favorite days. Because like (laughs) Sunday, you're just like, let's do it. Like, let's sit somewhere preferably with a patio maybe with like a fresh fountain sprite like there's a lot of great things that could happen from this um but it's not they're tired like those employees they are pooped by sunday like that is just the, especially if they have brunch service too like forget about it bless their souls brunch seems like a a, a rough shift in a restaurant to work <laughs> Brunch. So I don't like brunch because I have an issue with the fact that like the food during brunch and this is going to sound so petty. It's never like the right temperature. Well, because it's kind of meant to sit out, right? Like it's it's yeah, not, you, you're not getting it hot. <laughs> no. And this is not where they're getting their Michelin stars, like not right. on the brunch service. Everybody's just trying to get through it. Um, I actually used to work a brunch service just by myself because I couldn't find anybody that could consistently wake up in the morning. It feels like brunch food is designed, as far as I can tell, for people to put something in their stomachs for the mimosas that they're also drinking at brunch. Like it's just a base. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not good. Exactly. Food. It's almost yeah. like it's like drunken stoner food. Right. You know, like, yeah. please cram some Nutella between this bread pudding french toast like it's a lot 
Yeah, which that just that alone describing that sounds like something that shouldn't be sitting for too long, <laughs> like before it's eaten. No. <laughs> yeah, it does not sound like it's going to sit outside or <laughs> like for no, a prolonged period I've, of time. It's a haggard service. But so Mondays and Tuesdays, when you go to that seafood restaurant, those are absolutely the best ones. Now, if you're not being hyper specific, not a concern. You know what I mean? Like. There are days to eat there, whatever you can follow that flow. But for the most part, restaurants now are such well oiled machines that you can't really go wrong. Are there standard days that like the chef isn't there? Is that kind of standard? For sure. Yeah. Wednesdays. So the executive chef is typically there like Monday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, maybe they take a Sunday off because they've paid their dues like. Sunday, again, I don't mean to shit on Sunday, (laughs) but here we are. Sunday's a rough day in the restaurants. Yeah, we're all exhausted on Sunday, both the people in the restaurant and the people (laughs) coming to the restaurant. So the chef might not be there on Sundays. That being said, there's an enthusiasm from that sous chef that has a whole day to run the ship themselves that is like pretty beautiful. You know, that's their day. Um. But yeah, I honestly don't think it matters if the chef's there or not, like given some of the chefs I've worked for, like. Well, and a lot of them probably aren't really super hands on if things are going well, right? Like they're just kind of overseeing. So it's not like they're preparing it versus they're not preparing it. They're just there. Exactly. Unless you're like Brad Pitt and then you better believe that that chef's hand has been on every (laughs) pee on that plate. Yeah. But other than that, they're just there to like literally and this is fine dining much more than it is like quick service but they're there to make sure every plate is beautiful things are cooked to temp paperwork is done temper tantrums are thrown (laughs) um insecurities are either heightened or eliminated you know like yeah they're just trying to make sure that environment that everyone feels cutthroat and competing for spots stifling and maybe like they (laughs) won't be able to do it tomorrow yeah yeah yeah. you need someone yeah so they don't have time to do like prep work too they gotta really be focused no (laughs) no they're doing the cushy jobs yeah yeah that was always, I remember that as like a top chef thing when they would do that as like uh, the top chef, what do they call it? Masters, right? Where you'd see some of that where yeah. they'd bring the people in that clearly had not actually cooked oh. food <laughs> that were then sort of, yes. you know, trying to remember how to <laughs> like dice. So, yeah, absolutely. There's such, and even if you were to put me into a, high volume kitchen right now i would probably really really struggle but it's all muscle memory and it's also a very youthful muscle memory like you need to have that like umph to you and i i think of jonathan waxman who i am his like super fan like just the most incredible guy and i think he does still cook on the line but his role now he's probably in his 60s i would say is to run these beautiful restaurants, make sure that his name is being honored throughout, come up with incredible recipes. And then he's hired people who he has trained so well to do the actual like labor right. of it. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah. Your your quality control, yeah. like in all seriousness. <laughs> yes, that's a very good way to put it. And some restaurateurs are like real shit bags and they just back off and take the credit and then other ones are not said shit bags. <laughs> I uh, know both. Yes. <laughs> that's also, yeah, I because you mentioned Bradley Cooper. I just keep thinking about that, the shooking oysters uh, thing from that movie that burnt, like where he, didn't he? he oh, like, that was such a traumatic movie. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Bradley Cooper, between, between that and that Lady Gaga movie, David left me alone to watch that by myself. And he came, he like woke up and I was sobbing so hard. And Burnt was very similar, but also like relatable. But that being said, Ratatouille is also relatable. So it's. Yeah, I prefer my Bradley Cooper to be a CGI raccoon. That's that's my preferred. I mean, preach Bradley Cooper, but preach. He somehow uh, he like digs into my heart. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So we kind of covered the day to go, but we first you got to find a restaurant. So how what is the best way to sort of I guess like vet a restaurant to make sure yeah. that you're finding a good place? So I think the internet is a place of fear and a place of great recommendations. And so I do, let's say I haven't heard of the restaurant or I'm going to go visit a new city or something. The first thing I do is I ask my friends, like, yeah, yeah. where do you eat? Then if they tell me places they've eat, I'll go on Instagram. I'll just look at not the pictures that the restaurants post, but the pictures other people post. Yeah. Because bitches don't lie on the gram <laughs> when it comes to this stuff. Like. It's rough out there, but I think it's a great way to kind of figure it out. Um, Because that's that's a whole like, you know, I mean, that happens, I think, more in fast food. But that's like a whole industry of just food photography, of just making something like you can make a plate look good for one photo for Instagram or for an ad. Absolutely. And like, you know, we all talk about like Instagram influencers and shit, but like that's like one percent. Like if your name is not Kendall or Kylie, like nobody is paying you bazookas of money to do that. But you can tell a lot like and people don't really lie. And I actually think that it's a better way. And I feel like this could cause some upheaval, but I feel like it's a better way than looking at a Yelp or an open table review because. I have a friend in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She owns this gorgeous restaurant called Pagu. And all of her reviews right now are really bad because she's kept up with these mask mandates. So people aren't even talking about the food, but they're lowering her rating because yeah. she's just trying to keep people safe. Yelp does seem like a place for petty grievances. Like I've noticed that or sometimes I'll look up a restaurant and it'll be you know, I didn't like my server or, you know, like they were out of, you know, I ordered this wine and they didn't have it. And I'm like, well, that doesn't impact. Bitch, they me. only made so many bottles. Like, yeah. let's not cry over this. Yeah, no, there'll be or like they took such and such off the menu. I've read a lot of like personal beef, <laughs> like Yelp reviews. I can't with the Yelp. And honestly, like I typically don't. What I use Yelp for is like. I need a manicure mm -hmm. like things. And I don't know if that's because restaurants are so close to my heart that I'm like, please. But I find people are so petty and you will not find a good review. That being said, David and I used to live down the street from a place called Yummy Chinese. And the reviews on that were some of the funniest <laughs> we never ate there because it was so scary. The first line was like, not so yummy in my tummy. Oh, no. Loved it. So there is some humor to be had. But I don't I don't really look to that. Also, if there's food that you like to eat, that, you know, that's sort of like, does this look good? Does it have a good ambiance or does it have a shit ambiance? And that's what I'm looking for. Like, I am the queen of 95 percent of my meals are spent at what most would consider subpar restaurants because a lot of the time I don't want to cook dinner. I just want to sit there with other people that I don't have to talk to. Like I'm there for the experience and not for the food. If the food's supposed to be super amazing, that's typically when I'm underwhelmed. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, that's the thing, like living in L.A., some of the best restaurants in L.A. are in a strip mall that you would drive by, <laughs> you know, the one Absolutely. you have the fancy stuff. But some of the best food is just in the most unassuming, poorly marked <laughs> or it's a, a stand or like a food truck, you know, has like some amazing food here. Which makes me so I'm not the most L.A. person like I like it, but. I've never seen L.A. as like a person visiting a friend in L.A. It's like, no, here are these cameras and we're going to follow you around or like just really strange circumstances. But you have so much culture. Yeah. No, that, that's what I love about L.A. is there's it's whenever people say they don't like L.A., it's like, well, what did you do and what did you want to do? Because there's L.A. can be radically different depending on what experience you're looking for and like what mm -hmm. you go about. Like, yeah, because and food wise, there are so many options, like any food that you would want. They have it in L.A. Like it's one That's of the, the things craziest I really, part. Yeah. Like you can eat 
any cuisine and up here in southern maine we are very very limited and that's not talking shit it's just like there's no What's real it? i mean i grew up in a, a small town where i remember when they built the mcdonald's because we got excited because we had only had a burger king <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that we were also getting a mcdonald's was you know you had to drive 25 Ooh. minutes to go to a sit-down restaurant <laughs> like that was good a, yeah. and that's what we called them a sit-down exactly restaurant. yeah that is a term of endearment for everybody born before 1990. Um, I completely agree. And since we've moved up here, we go up to Portland a lot, which has incredible food, incredible food. But where we live now, it's mostly like Clam Shack, Clam Hut, Lobster Cove, blah, 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 which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I don't hate it. Um but, you know, there, there's always those issues. But when it comes to a restaurant, the best thing you can do is hear word of mouth. Right. And especially yeah. like one thing that like warms my heart more than just about anything is going to go visit those strip mall restaurants where they're busy. Don't get me wrong. Like they've got a great customer base, but they are so grateful mm -hmm. for you. And so much love we when we were filming top chef we did on our second episode we went to um an indian restaurant that it's i'm blanking on the name right now but you know there were cameras and this is a very famous place but i could still see the love was put into the food that would have been put in the food had you taken away from the cameras and i still follow them on instagram and like talk to this woman pretty consistently and she's always rooting me on and like mm -hmm. there's I think the greatest thing about restaurants as a diner is that you can become part of a family, you know, like restaurant people are so social, even the non-social ones, they're still doing this job to be, this is their thing. And you can make such connections. And like, before I had like the 0 0.2 ounces of like facial recognition that I have now, I still felt that way, yeah. you know, and, and that's like, so tip well is what I'm saying. Tip well, respect the people that are serving you. And like, there's a lot of really cool things about a restaurant. Well, there is, a, that is such a great experience of when you have a local place, that's like your regular place. And if you tip well, and if you're nice and they like you, or they kind of you you get to almost feel like you're in Goodfellas or something where you kind of walk in and yes. like they're excited to see you. They're going to get you a nice table. Like, no, that's a yeah, great. Like you're the one coming in and you become. The center of the focus. Yeah, I still remember uh, when I lived in Maryland, there was this pizza place I went to. I'll be honest, too often. I was single at the time. I was like <laughs> regularly there like once a week after work and I would go in and it it got to the point where. The, the guy who ran it, he would look at me and he would just have the pizza ready. I ordered the same thing every time. So he was like already ready to ring it up as soon as I walked in. I didn't never had to say anything. And then one day I went in and it was a new employee. And, you know, of course, like I'm fine. Like I'm waiting and the guy, you right. know, I'm, but the, <laughs> the owner walks in and goes, what? no. No, you see this guy, he doesn't wait. No, this is his order. Like he's like like getting to the new guy, like, no, these guys, he's very important. Like he needs like that's how much he like, wanted to do. Yeah. That just means so much to me. It's like there's so many places, but I always like, you know, my parents, my family, and I we used to go out to like Easter lunch or like something. And even when I was a baby cook, like, no, nobody, nobody should have known me, whatever. As soon as my mother, who always dropped a bomb, she'd be like, she's a cook or like a <laughs> chef, like, ooh, we always had just like, it was such a baller moment. Meanwhile, I had like six dollars in my bank account, but it didn't matter. I was just like, oh, and that first time you get that like comped glass of wine mm -hmm. or like a little special something. Oh, you get an amuse what, bouche at the local restaurant like that's yeah. I, I mean, heart is exploding. Yeah, exploding. And coming from the restaurant side, they love to do that. Yeah. You know, if you're a crap person, they will 
subliminally do everything in their power not to take care of you. Like yeah. you are not wanted, but bless your soul. I'm sure Burger King will <laughs> love to see you. Uh, now I'm curious though, too, because so you said before all the TV stuff and everything, your mom would do this. So mm -hmm. does she do that now? Like now that you like, does she like say this is my daughter who was on Top Chef? She's gotten a little bit better. Um, she's gotten a little bit better. But as I've said about my parents, and I don't think I've said it to you, they're like non-stage stage parents. <laughs> like they just, even growing up, my dad was like, Stephanie, when you walk into a room, they turn. Mind you, I was like a chubby 14-year-old with bad skin <laughs> and no self-confidence. Like they were not turning. But they've always been like so supportive and like, yes. Um, but yeah, they still do that. And it's like we go for Chinese food for every Christmas. And my brother Wyatt took like a few years of Mandarin at NYU. And my mother oh, no. <laughs> numerous times has made him speak Mandarin to the servers. And then they all come out and like it's a beautiful thing. Is and also horrifying because I don't think Wyatt's Mandarin is like up to par necessarily, but he he does well. Is he ordering for everybody? Is she making him order for the table? Like in Mandarin? No, he's like, how are you? How is your family? Oh, yeah. Merry oh. Christmas. I don't know what he says because I couldn't even get through two years of Spanish. But like, but yeah, my mom, my favorite story is we were at Sportello in Boston for my birthday. And this woman comes up. She's 10 months pregnant. She's like, this is her last meal before she goes into labor. And she's like, I just wanted you to know that we loved you on Top Chef New Orleans, blah, blah, blah. And my mother looks her dead in the eyes and goes, do you want a picture? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, Mama, I don't think she wants a picture. I don't I think she just I was like, thank you. Run away. <laughs> Run away. It'd be great if your mom just pulled out a stack of like eight by tens and were like, they're five a piece. Uh, ten if you want them personalized. You know? <laughs> so true. So true. They're so supportive and so cute and like amazing. But they're they're super into it. But yeah, there's something really to be said. And I know we've gotten a little bit off topic about going to those places where for me in Boston, it was the butcher shop and my husband was the chef there. But I didn't go to see him. I went there because Zoe and Matt and Sarah, like these people were my family. So if I had a good day, I'd go get a glass of wine. If I had a bad day, I'd go get a glass of wine. They took such incredible care of me that they truly like were part of who I was. And anybody can have that experience. So when you're lonely, like that's the beauty of restaurants. It's like, you're there to make these connections and connections are the most important thing to restaurant people. No. Yeah. It's a relationship. Like it, it really is. Yeah. yeah. No, it's such a cool thing. There's, there's a guy at the butcher shop, Richard, um, retired, amazing, amazing guy. He goes to the butcher shop every Friday at four sits in the same seat and he is just so loved, you know, he's just, and that restaurant has seen good food, bad food, good servers, bad servers. They've seen everything. But he he's a staple, you know, like if Richard didn't show up for two weeks, somebody would send a welfare check like he's he's family. Yeah, no, that's and I just love that. No, that's really cool. And that that's the stuff that breaks my heart with just like the past few years and how much restaurants have definitely been struggling. People, yeah. People really lost a lot of that connection and that being said you see people now that keep popping up these restaurants and this is when i get a little jaded because i'm like nobody makes money opening restaurants i'm just gonna nobody that is not if you're thinking about investing you're not going to get your money back if you are thinking about owning you're not going to get your time back like it has to be a true passion and that's why I think that we all need to work really hard to support those places that have been open for five, 10 years that battled through the pandemic to make sure that their staff was taken care of to to really support them because they're they're the ones that need it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. In a world 
where people watch movies. I think I'm going to watch a movie. Sometimes they don't like what they see. I don't like this movie. But sometimes they look for the silver lining. Wait a second. I like this part of this movie. Joel and Andy do that work for you. The Silver Linings Playback. I like this part of this podcast where they tell me the part of the movie I like. Every Monday on the Peak Sloth Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. One of the other things that I do want to ask about. So, like, we now we found the restaurant. We've asked friends. We've looked online. We found the restaurant. Uh, what if, if it's something that someone's unfamiliar with, maybe they're, they're taking a chance. What are some of the, like, I don't know, safer things? Like if they're a picky eater, they want to try something new. Like what, what's a good, any restaurant you walk into, what are, what are your safe bets? So honestly, let's say we're starting at like a comfortable restaurant, anything fried, no matter what they do to it, always going to taste very similar. Yep. That chicken dish probably going to taste very similar where people get really creative i'm finding now is on those vegetarian meals like they might go a wall they yeah. might just go for whatever those are actually the bigger struggle ones i also think that there's a real movement to get back to flavors that are comfortable so those scary dishes are kind of going away with the molecular and the yeah stuff you know, I love them. I think there's a place for it. I do not know how to do it, but like props. Good for you. Amazing. Um, but I think restaurants are really getting back to like the food tastes good. One of my favorite things. Um, so wine ordering is so stressful. <laughs> I do not speak French. I do not speak any of these languages. Um, and I had this great friend, Tim, who owned this restaurant, Rebelle. It was insane. But he actually labeled the wines one, two, three, four, five, so that people did not have to choke <laughs> on their shitty French. And I loved that. But I asked a friend, Maddie, who is lifetime server, just amazing guy. And I was like, dude, do you get upset when people point? And he was like, no, I'm so appreciative because some people garble the pronunciation so bad that I can't keep a straight face. Yeah. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I would also imagine, yeah, as a, as a server, you just, I would imagine speed and clarity. Like if you, if you have a lot of tables, you just want to know what they want and you want to make sure you have the right thing. So if they're pointing, that's probably a lot better than them possibly saying one wine, but it sounds like another wine or it's unclear. You have to ask again. I get that. Yeah. Speed and clarity should be a t-shirt. Yeah. Because... When we start selling merch, everything. yeah, when we start selling merch for this yeah. podcast, that'll be the Speed first Speed and shit. Clarity knows yeah. some shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, be- beautifully said, but servers are there to answer your questions. And I know when I worked for Barbara, every week we had, every day we had to go over the menus. So we would quiz the servers, like, what's the fourth component of the tasting menu you know and they would like know it they're really like educated and honestly like even when you go to like my secret favorite restaurant texas roadhouse where i've only been twice but Mm -hmm. it's been magical both times um those people still really know what's on the menu like they're trained for it and i think that some people look at restaurants and they're like It's like an in-between college job or it's like I never figured my life out. That's not the case at all. People are passionate about it. And just because you don't cook and you're not a sommelier, you're a server, does not take away from that passion at all. So ask your servers and truth be told, they will not lie because they don't want to send you something you are not going to like and then have to deal with the repercussions of sending it back dealing with the chef comping your meal like and all the getting the manager they don't want to do that so they will steer you in the correct direction yeah no i i think you're 100 percent right the people who are good at that because that's a skill i knew i never had like i i i'm not cut out to be a server i'm i don't have the people skills i don't have the like 
management skills. Like, but it's yeah, the people that can do that well, that are personable, they can answer all the questions, they have to deal with all the like, you know, letting people know that there's either food's going to be delayed or what, you know, just like making every table feel like you're taking, like they're the table that's your top priority. I nothing but respect for servers. Like, I think it's, it's a hard job. <laughs> When I, I worked at this incredible restaurant, SRV, and I was only there to make the pasta and I was having like a bit of an existential crisis where I was like, we were like financially not doing 100 percent. Like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had all this free time at night. So I was like, I went to my girl, Deirdre, who was the GM of like all the restaurants. She's insane. She's incredible. Um, and I was like, I would love to try and do a server stage at their sister restaurant salty pig which was like i mean in the name like charcuterie pizza pasta whatever and she was like all right steph she was like she's known me for a thousand years she was like i don't know if this is what you're looking for but like so happy to indulge you and you can just get to the bottom of it dude i was so bad <laughs> I go to a table. I'm like freaking out. I can't figure out how, how to hold the wine glasses. I can't even figure out how to pour water. And this table was like, yeah, we just need another second with the menu. I stood there. <laughs> I didn't just stare at them right in the eyes. Because <laughs> I didn't know how long a second was. Right, I was right. like, like, four minutes. Can I set a timer? Like, can we? <laughs> I... And after that, I got home. I think this is when I was still drinking. I think I drank two bottles of wine by oh, no. myself which i could do like your girl can throw down but <laughs> it wasn't like fun like let's party it was like how do i get this anxiety out of my head yeah yeah that's what it feels like yeah i think anxiety is the right word to me it just yeah it when i think of serving it feels like that that old bit where it's like the plates are spinning and you have to keep all the like literal plates spinning those people that, like that's what it, it's just constant fires being put out in my mind like thinking about that job that is also if you look at the way a dining room is designed and the way tables are designed the only thing that makes sense is the bar so you've got a bar that seats 11 yeah. 1 through 11 very easy to do you get to the floor there's a group of 70, a group that starts at 55. I was like, does, is it just my brain that doesn't get this? And they were yeah. like, oh, you'll get used to it. I never, I called Deirdre that night and I was like, that, that was not good. She was like, I didn't, I didn't want to discourage you. You know, that's <laughs> what makes her amazing. She was like, but I didn't think it was going to be your jam. And I was like, not my jam, dude. I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> You couldn't get out of there fast enough. I think this is a perfect segue uh, to ask the question then of tipping. So let's let's talk okay. about tipping. I've got strong opinions. Yeah. So the greatest thing I ever learned when it comes to math, which is not my subject, was move the decimal place yep. over in times by two. Yep. And that's 20%. Yep. Um, you read a lot about minimum wage and stuff, and I am not about to get into the politics of that. But servers do not make money if you do not tip them. Right. Yeah. It's built in. Their hourly wage is nothing. They live that off of That is how it's done. Yeah. yeah. And there is no, again, like, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but that is, that is just how it's done. So there have been times, like, I'm not about to he sit here on my high horse and be like, I had the worst service in my life, but I still gave them 20%. Like, I'll do 15 or 10, because if you're going to be a shit bag, I... That was also my hard earned money that I just paid to like experience this. Um, but I am a staunch 20 percenter. Yeah, because it's amazing. And if there is and this is controversial, if there is that tip the kitchen. I do like because your girl's not made out of money, so I'll <laughs> do like 10, 15 percent. And if it's a pooling thing, I think that's greater. Again, I've never worked front of the house, so pooling could be the best if you're not the best server or the worst if you are. Um, but I always remember, like, my mom was a flight attendant and every once in a while she would get, like, tips. And even if it was $7, she came home beaming because yeah. it's a really great way to 
figure out like if people appreciate you. So I'm a 20 percenter. Does it mean they're going to kiss your ass? No, but it means you did something really good. And those shifts are hard, just like just like anybody's job, I assume. But, you know, you're acknowledging thank you for being a nice person. Thank you for making this meal better because of being a nice person. And it's it's important. And if people do not tip and I love my husband so much for this, like he went out with somebody to not be named and they did not tip very well. And David went out to the car with them to be like, oh, we're leaving. And he was like, oh, shit, I think I left my wallet or he was like, I have to go to the bathroom. And he left a little bit more because, you know money's money's rough on these streets like you gotta you gotta respect the people that are showing up and doing these jobs yeah you're also being served like it's the same when you get a manicure or a pedicure like somebody is serving you in a way that they you know could be seen as like demeaning show them the respect that they deserve yeah no for sure i also tip more if i'm with people that i know (laughs) are like absolutely bothering them. and then i yeah. put i put yes. the other like yeah, you the slip other it, yeah. copy up so i don't have to deal with like yeah what could potentially be happening <laughs> right um but when i was broke it was harder to tip and i just didn't go out as often right like, no i would no do the same anymore. yeah i would do the same i feel like yeah it's a bad move to be like well i only have enough money to eat but not to tip when well, it's like yeah don't go out do carry That's out when you or something go to the food court yeah also like a beautiful thing food court's a great thing like exactly yeah but these people are showing up to work to possibly get like berated by a bunch of customers the best thing you can do is be the one that they remember yeah and again this is like so incredibly close to my heart because restaurants and food is my life but you know just take care of them yeah no for sure all right well before we wrap up here i know that we like to to end these shows uh by sharing an embarrassing story of yours and i know that you have a embarrassing restaurant related story (laughs) this is a doozy um so i've experienced a lot as an employee as an employer And as a diner, and this story goes back to the most horrific dining experience I ever had. So my entire life, I've choked on food. It's just been a thing. I'm just, I just choke. Normally, it's embarrassing. We move on. And it's like, oh, stuff choked. Like nobody's ever like, oh, this could be her last breath. So my parents, David and I, We had just gone through like a lot of loss, a lot of grief, but we were also about to get married. So David and I were like, I think it's really important. We like sit down as a family and, you know, we talk about the impending nuptials and we get all this stuff that like. I don't know, like you have to talk about wedding stuff if you have a wedding. So we're like, let's go to Billy T's in the North End. That is a Chinese restaurant in the Italian district of Boston. But it's delicious <laughs> and amazing. So we sit down. We all order Mai Tais. I like slurp mine down. Like it is the most delicious. It is like the nectar of the gods. And food starts coming out and there's a plate of boneless spare ribs. I fucking love boneless spare ribs. I'm like, <laughs> sign me up. This is amazing. We're all talking. Somebody makes a joke. I've got a boneless spare rib in my mouth. It is goes down my throat and i'm like oh no this is not choking it is stuck oh in my throat nobody can see my face but it is like i'm like oh my god so david comes like my knight in shining armor to do the heimlich and i'm like no (laughs) because i can breathe it's in a different tube oh and he's like oh my god So I stand up and now my mother and father are just like, they're looking and they're like, what do we do? You know, this is like Mama Cass and the ham sandwich. Like, (laughs) is this how I go? So David gingerly lifts me up and brings me into the men's bathroom, which if you're a woman, (laughs) a man's bathroom is just like it's uncharted territory. Like very rarely do I choose to go 
into a man's bathroom. <laughs> but so now I'm, I'm like gagging and trying to puke and it's not working. It is stuck. I'm turning some shades like Oof. things are happening. So there's a nurse in the restaurant and she's like, don't make her throw up like she knows what's happening. She's like, are you OK? And I'm like, fine. So I'm like, Dad, I don't say any of these words, but somebody is like, Greg, go get the car. Because this isn't like 911. It should have been 911, but we are not reacting like 911 should be called. So David pays the bill for all the food that we didn't eat. We still hold this like. We're still horrified by that part because it was expensive. Mm -hmm. Um. And my dad's like, off we go. So it's me, my mom, and David in my dad's Jetta, which I always joke, but it is not a joke, basically runs on three wheels. Like, this shit is... <laughs> I don't know how this car runs. And we drive to MGH. I'm gagging in the back seat, And I've been there. You know, if you listen to this podcast, I have been there <laughs> to Mass General, Man's Greatest Hospital, several times. Never had such expedited service. We go in and my mom's trying to say things. And she's like, she is choking. And the woman's like, we need to get her a wheelchair. And I'm like, mm -mm, mm -mm. And she's like, girl, you're turning blue. We need to get you a wheelchair. And I'm like, OK, sit me down in the wheelchair. And they like blood pressure isn't even taken. They're like, we got to we got to expedite this even faster. Oh, no. I go into room one, <laughs> which I feel like is the special room. Like you, that's a special room. I've never been in room one. I'm always like room eight. So these four nurses come in, young, cute, adorable. And they're like, what's going on? And now, now my mother is trying to take a picture of me and telling me to look sicker so she can text her friends. <laughs> God only knows. I, I thought you were going to say your mother's telling the nurses as you're choking. This is my daughter. She was on Top Chef. She's a... <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so, it probably came out and I just blanked out during that part. <laughs> David is clutching my purse in the corner because he's like, my fiance is about to shit the bed. And my father is showing the nurses pictures of his new Labradoodle, Benny. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, so this is going a certain way. And they, I've got the little blue bag of shame and they're trying to talk to me and just like I'm like foaming at the mouth. So this nurse, ironically, was doing her thesis on like choking victims or something like that i don't know but she was like can we try something that's not like necessarily protocol but you know i know it's gonna work and i'm like whatever needs to happen right now <laughs> just make it happen like i'm this could be this could be it and this is going to be so embarrassing in my obituary i'm like oh my god but also you're not saying this because you can't talk right i, assume. I can't talk yeah i yeah, can't yeah. talk so, yeah. and she like tried to look down my throat i like gag on her like Oof. bile it was just a whole scene so she's like all right here's what we're gonna do she's like we're gonna give you a muscle relaxant shot i'm like sounds great whatever she's like then we're gonna give you a pain something under your tongue and i'm like cool she's like then we are going to give you a shot of meat tenderizer <laughs> and i'm like makes sense okay it kind of feels like a weird elaborate prank though a little bit <laughs> the whole situation was bizarre yeah so dad's still showing pictures of the dog mom's still taking pictures telling me to look sicker david still is about to pet keel over himself due to trauma from this whole experience so we start the process shot they're like great pain pill under the tongue great and then everybody starts screaming shot 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 <laughs> As I take this meat tenderizer down the gullet. Also, where did the meat tenderizer come from? They just have some in the <laughs> pantry. <laughs> okay. They just have some in the pantry. Joel, that boneless spare rib went down as if there was never anything constricting. That was it. I, yeah. I was cured. I was cured. Um, months later, I did have to go to like an actual doctor and they inflated a balloon in my trachea because there was actually like a small issue with that small being the keyword. Like I have like a small food pipe. I don't know. Wow. Talk about feeling special. Yeah. But that was 
that doesn't even I just really wanted to tell that story, I guess, because it really only experienced Billy T's in the North End for about 20 minutes that we were there. But that was that was horrifying. It doesn't sound like you got a lot of wedding planning done either. Oh, God, we didn't plan the (laughs) wedding until two weeks before. it. I was like, you know what? I was like, somehow we're getting married and nobody needs to know what's going on, including myself. (laughs) Yeah, that's the best way to do it. So what you're saying is everyone should just carry meat tenderizer around with them just in case. Well, honestly, I'm like, if I choke again and boneless spare ribs were like an issue for me for a long time because I was like kind of traumatized and they're so delicious. (laughs) They're so delicious. And I was like, you know, this doesn't really like bode well for me. I almost died that one time. But now I eat them again. And since the whole balloon in the throat thing, we're good. That was it. That... We're good. <laughs> so, the, did We're they actually good. like expand your throat? Like, your throat is now. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was so painful. That sounds it's terrible. S- spatch key or spatch cock. It's like, it's like some medical term for whatever's wrong. It did not go well. Let's just say before the surgery, I, they were like, do you want, of course, my mother had to take me. Mm-hmm. This was like two years ago. Um, They were like, do you want her to come into the room when you're done? And I was like, no, I'm like a big girl. I can totally (laughs) handle it. And I woke up from like being knocked out. And I was like, where's my mom? (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) She was already in the room. She knew that this was not going to go well. She was like, "Okay, I'll just be there. I think I'm also now wondering, do you think you're in a medical journal somewhere? Do you think this nurse absolutely <laughs> like cited you? If not one, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, both for the balloon and the meat tenderizer. There's just multiple. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was a remarkable experience that you know, had I really looked into it, we probably would have eloped. I think that was the sign. Just elope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yep. Just elope. Yep. Yeah. Just, It'll just be get, easier on everybody. Just get in the car, head straight for Vegas. Like, just <laughs> imagine. Yeah. We might do it again. Just get remarried. It's a dream. Um, but yeah. that's my that's my restaurant story. That's one of the better ones. That one's I got good. plenty I... from being an employee, but I thought that one would really just engage our listeners. No, I love it, and i I hope this gets to that nurse somehow. That's all I want is for the nurse to listen to this and to to check in. I hope she's doing well. Yeah, yeah, me too. No, I want an update. I want to know. my life. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, that there's no better way to end this show than that. Like, that is the perfect note to go. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's a mic drop right there. Right? <laughs> yeah. And that's it. So, if you're confused, we probably are too. But together, we can figure it out. Stephanie Knows Some Shit is hosted by Stephanie Smar and me, Joel Murphy, and produced by me. If you enjoyed the show, give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, and instead of a review, tell us about a meal that you ate or made recently. We'd love to read about it. 